Hey everybody, welcome back to the ECG channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, or WPW syndrome. This is a syndrome that um, is named after these three um, doctors, but really the concept of Wolf-Parkinson-White is this concept of pre-excitation. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanism behind pre-excitation and what that mechanism, how it displays itself on ECGs. So this is going to be um, pretty fun. And so just to start off, we know that like normal conduction, let's just outline normal conduction real quick. We've got the SA node here that fires off. We've got atrial depolarization. And atrial depolarization can't just enter into the ventricles anywhere, right? We've got this some membrane, connective tissue throughout. It's called the cardiac skeleton. Right? We've got this cardiac cardiac skeleton that keeps that signal from just entering into the ventricles. It makes it so that the AV node is the only location with which that signal can be then transferred down into the ventricles for ventricular depolarization. And so that's why on our ECG we have a nice distinct P wave with a nice flat PR interval. And then we have our nice sharp narrow QRS and our T wave. So that's normal conduction. Well, what happens with Wolf-Parkinson-White or pre-excitation syndrome? Well, there's a defect in that cardiac skeleton. And so that cardiac skeleton that I drew in blue has a little defect. And I'm going to draw that defect to be right here on uh, this side. And I'm going to draw it kind of like this. We've got a defect. And so this is some type of defect. Most of the time, it's you know, you're born with it. And so you have this defect, and so let's talk about then what happens when we get our depolarization. Okay, so what happens? We have the SA node that fires off, and what do we get? We get our P wave, right? So we have our P wave that travels across the atria again. And usually the AV node, when it captures that P wave, the AV node holds on to it, that signal, for 120 to 200 milliseconds before passing it off to the ventricles, right? That's our PR interval, is our AV needle function. And that's what allows for our ventricles to fill. But what happens in this case is this defect allows for that atrial wave to go into the ventricles. The difference, though, is that this tissue does not delay the signal the way the AV node does. And so you get pre-excitation. The AV node is holding on to that signal like we see it. It's just pausing. And in between that time when we see for 120, 200 milliseconds, it allows for this area, this defect, what we would call really, we'll say in more efficient or uh, appropriate terms, an accessory pathway. That accessory pathway allows for conduction into the ventricles, and so the ventricles begin to slowly depolarize. And that depolarization occurs slowly because it's just going from cell to cell gap junction. It's not taking the Hisperkinji system. We get slow depolarization until the AV node says, okay, I've delayed the signal for long enough and passes it down. And when it passes it down, we get rapid depolarization of the rest of the ventricles. And how is this represented on the ECG? Well, we have our P wave, which represents our atrial depolarization. But instead of having that flat PR interval, you start having slurring upstroke. And then, what is that slurring upstroke representing? It's representing slow depolarization of the ventricles, right? It correlates these two arrows correlate to each other. And then, once the AV node passes that signal down, then we get that sharp deflection of our QRS and the T wave that follows. And that slurred region is the delta, delta wave. And that delta wave is a slow takeoff. It's not sharp. Why? Because it's going from, like we said, cell to cell gap junction. And that delta wave and slurring takeoff occurs 
what we would say at the expense of the PR interval. Why? Well, the PR interval is what's representing the period of the AV node slowing that signal down. And while it's slowing that signal down, while we should be in this period, we get a little bit of pre-exciting waves throughout the ventricles. And so our PR interval in these patients will subsequently shorten. Notice the shortening of the PR interval. So my PR interval, if it's short, will be typically less than or at the lower end of 120 milliseconds, which is our normal lower limit of normal. And let's take a look at what that looks like on this ECG. So here we see we've got a rhythm that is quite regular. You can see it's regular throughout the entirety of this strip. The rate of this rhythm looks to be about, if I find a QRS on a solid line like here, it's 300, 150, 175, just over 75 beats per minute. We'll call it 78 beats per minute. I see that I've got P waves in front of my QRSs. My P waves are upright in lead one and they're upright in ABS. These are sinus node generated P waves. But when I measure my PR interval, maybe I'll come down here to V5. You can see it really well. Look at the beginning of the P to the beginning of that QRS. That's like 2.5 millimeters, 2.5 little boxes. And so that tells me my PR interval, if 40 millimeters are um, in every little box, my PR interval in this case is 100 milliseconds. And that's less than the 120 milliseconds that we think is the kind of the lower limit of normal. And then you're like, okay, I see that it's occurring with these slow delta waves. Look at these delta waves. These are the delta waves. And these delta waves are occurring, and then we have a nice narrow sharp QRS to finish it off. Then we have a nice narrow sharp QRS to finish it off. And these delta waves are what is allowing for the PR interval to get shorter. And so my PR interval here is shortening, like we said, at the expense of, um, or the QRS is widening at the expense of the PR interval, right? So you'll see the QRS here will get wide, right? Because we have this slurred delta wave, but it will become wide, like we said, at the expense of the PR interval. And so that is how you diagnose somebody on ECG with Wolf Parkinson White, which is secondary to the accessory pathway. This is evidence of pre-excitation in the ventricles, where we have P wave, we've got slow delta wave, we've got the remainder of our narrow QRS complex. And so we're not gonna talk about exactly where these accessory pathways can occur. They can occur anywhere in that cardiac skeleton membrane between the atria and the ventricles. And you can actually, it's an advanced concept, but you can actually map it out based on where the delta waves are the most prominent. They're not gonna be in every lead, right? You can see maybe here in AVL, these delta waves are a little bit less prominent. So you're not gonna see them as, as equally in every lead because it depends on where it's at and where you pick up those delta waves on this ECG. And so that's a good example of a Wolf-Parkinson-White pre-excitation syndrome, right? We are pre-exciting the ventricles. Let's look at another one. This is another good example. We've got a rhythm that's regular. It's a regular rate. I'm not going to calculate the rate. You see I've got P waves in front of my QRS that are upright in lead one, that are upright in AVFs, so they're sinus. But when I look at that PR interval, it's really short. Look how short that PR interval. My PR is less than 120 milliseconds. With some widening of the QRS, this seems like to be the problem. My QRS looks a little bit wider than it should be. But it seems like the second half of my QRS is, na is nice and sharp, right? So look, we got this widening of the QRS, and then we have sharp QRS. We've got over here, widening, slurring of the QRS, but then the remainder of it is nice and sharp. So that tells you kind of the order of operations. Remember, the first step is the pre-excitation of the ventricles. 
And then the second step is the normal AV node to the Hisperkinji system. And that's why you get a nice narrow kind of ending to the QRS, but not the beginning. The beginning is that pre-excited delta wave. So I hope this helps you kind of understand the physiology of this Wolf-Parkinson-White pre-excitation. You know, why do we worry about Wolf-Parkinson-White? Well, just really quickly, if I've got this heart here, and I've got my nice cardiac skeleton, right, that, that keeps my signal to only go into the ventricles via the AV node. And say I have a defect, an accessory pathway, that's located right here. This is my accessory pathway, right? Accessory pathway. Well, sometimes you can have signal that once the atria depolarize, it goes down the AV node through our Hisperkinji system and depolarizes the ventricles. And as the ventricles are depolarizing and it's depolarizing, sometimes that depolarizing wave can actually go retrograde up the accessory pathway. And by the time it gets there, the atria have already recovered. Then you get another wave of depolarization across the atria, which is then captured by the AV node again, sent down depolarizes the ventricles, and then you have this re-entry circuit. And it happens over and over and over again. And then you get re-entry up the accessory pathway, down the AV node. Up the accessory pathway, down the AV node. That is a form of supraventricular tachycardia, because it's going to occur very fast because it's not being controlled. It's just a re-entry circuit. And that's called AV reentry tachycardia. Not AV nodal reentry tachycardia, but AV reentry tachycardia or AVRT. Because we have a now a reentry circuit here between the atria and the ventricles. And that can put somebody into a supraventricular tachycardia where they've got these palpitations. So you have a young person that comes into the clinic with a history of palpitations and you know you might be thinking I wonder if they have an accessory pathway and so you get an ECG on them and you assess for what do you assess for one of the things you assess for these delta waves and that can hint at the diagnosis and then luckily there are treatments for these people where we can go in and f map it out to exactly where is the accessory pathway and then what do we do to it we ablate it, which just means with radio frequency, we can actually zap the tissue and it no longer can conduct. So I hope this video helps you all. If you enjoy this content, um, thinking about subscribing to the page, I love talking about the pathophysiology behind this. It really helps you understand um, which treatments work and why, right? Whether you're treating a supraventricular tachycardia in these patients, whether you're treating a Wolf-Parkinson-White patient with AFib, what have you. So I hope it helps. Um, if you have any questions, throw them down in the comments. And if not, um, have a great rest of your day. See you on the next video.